Good evening. Deborah Davis is a writer and former film executive who has worked as both a story editor and story analyst for several major film companies. Strapless was Deborah Davis's first book, published in 2003. It was followed by around eight other acclaimed books, including Guest of Honor, Booker T. Washington, Theodore Roosevelt, and the White House Dinner That Shocked the Nation, which is a winner of the prestigious Phyllis Wheatley Award for Best Work of History in 2013, and nominated for an NAACP Image Award. Also, Fabricius and the Goldfinch, named by Amazon as one of the best books of 2014, and more recently, The Trip, Andy Warhol's plastic fantastic cross-country adventure. She's also co-authored Tina Turner's memoir, My Love Story, and is working on a memoir with cooking superstar, Ina Garten. Good evening, Deborah. Hello, Aileen. Hi, and thank you for accepting our invitation to share your book, Strapless, with us. In the introduction to the book, you describe Strapless as, and I quote, the anatomy of a masterpiece revealing the often surprising, always vivid drama of Sargent, Gautreau, and the painting that made them immortal. So for those in the audience who might not have read the book, perhaps you could start us off by telling a bit more about the protagonist. Virginie Amélie Gautreau, or Amélie Gautreau as she preferred to be called, before she was later referred to in the painting as Madame X, and also about the American-born painter, John Singer Sargent, who painted this infamous portrait now hanging in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Well, Aileen, now I am totally ashamed of my French accent and now I can't pronounce a single person's name in this whole presentation because you say it so beautifully and um, while I have many talents, one of them is not my French pronunciation. So I'm, I'm asking for your forgiveness, all of you, um, and I will forge ahead. Uh, I wonder how many of you have seen the painting Madame X? Yes? Wait, I do. I have it. I've seen it at the Met, yes. Okay. But I'll bet that not many of you have seen the Madame X doll. Oh, no. What's that? This was done. It's a Madame Alexander doll. Madame Alexander doll. Oh. And you can see that she's missing a strap. Okay. Um, and her nose is not quite as generous as the real Madame X. But I think that this is an indication of, of how famous um, Madame X has become and, and what an icon she is. I first fell under her spell when I borrowed a dress to wear to a Hollywood award ceremony. It was long and black with a plunging neckline and thin straps that looked jeweled in the light. I knew the image of John Singer Sargent's remarkable painting, Madame X, but I wondered if there was a story behind the painting. So I started reading, looking through art books, and immediately I was hooked by the surprises and the contradictions that seemed to be in the story. Madame X, the quintessential French woman, was an American, born in New Orleans, and only 23 years old when she posed for the painting. Sargent, also an American, was an up and coming young artist and he was only 27 when he painted Amelie. Then I learned that when Madame X was shown at the 1884 Paris Salon, the art show to end all art shows, it caused a huge scandal, a scandal in Paris. Now that's an oxymoron. Right away, I knew this was a story of youth and ambition, of passion and risk, and I had to know more. So I set out on the great art adventure, determined to peek behind the canvas to find the people, Madame X, Sargent, and the glittering Belle Epoque world they inhabited. Now, let me tell you, if you're going to write a book let the locations of your research be Paris, Brittany, and New Orleans. How lucky was I? My approach to research is what I call walking the life. I wanted to see who these people were and how they lived. I searched for their homes, their papers, and their mementos. And I met with Madame X's descendants. I was like a detective 
going everywhere I could, searching for every clue. And my first stop was New Orleans, described as the best place in America to have a good time. And it's still the best place in America to have a good time. I learned that Madame X entered the world as Virginie Amelie Avignon, the daughter of wealthy parents who were direct descendants of the first French settlers in Louisiana. Anatole, her father, was a young lawyer. Marie Virginie Ternat, her mother, was a beautiful belle from Parlange Plantation. Amelie was born in 1859 and inherited the graceful Ternat form, but her face was all Avignon, her pallor, her red hair, and her Avignon nose which was graceful, but very long. Could I have the next slide, please? These are the two Avignon sisters. Virginie is on the left and her sister Valentine is on the right. Life in New Orleans was beautiful, privileged and secure until the Civil War changed all of that. Anatole died in battle and Amelie's younger sister died of a fever. So Marie Virginet, a widow in a city of widows, packed up Amelie and moved to Paris. There in the city of lights, Amelie was groomed for a brilliant marriage. By the time she was 17, there was a new social order. Down with the aristocrats, up with the businessmen, the power brokers of the Third Republic. And by 1877, there wasn't a businessman in Paris who didn't want Amelie for his trophy wife. She had emerged from adolescence as a swan. She was curvaceous with an ample turned up bosom and a narrow waist. Her pure white skin looked like marble and her face was totally original. She really had no choice. With a nose like that, she had to look down on the world. And she was waiting for her Prince Charming. But when he came, and this always happens, he looked more like a frog. Pierre-Louis Gautreau was twice her age and described as looking like Toulouse-Lautrec, which meant he was short. And he still lived with his mother, who controlled the purse strings. But the Gautreaux were very rich. They owned a beautiful estate in Brittany. He said he was a banker, but one of the sources of his money was less than glamorous, bat guano from Chile. He was in the fertilizer business and he called himself Pedro. Was Amelie disappointed? Not at all. Marriage meant freedom to go out, to shop, to flirt, even have discreet affairs. You actually couldn't have affairs until you were married. So it was a happy day for her. In Brittany, where I did the next part of my research, I found the ledger of Madame Le Chambre Gautreau, Amelie's mother-in-law. It was hiding in a library, a little library. And when I opened it, it was like looking at somebody's American Express bill. Pedro cost the family no money until he got married. But Amelie's disapproving mother-in-law noted wedding expenses with every slash of her pen. A line appeared that said, Toilette de Madame. Next slide, please. This is a page from the ledger and I can't even tell you how exciting it was to go through it because I could actually see the cost of her wedding gown. It was white velvet, um, the cost of the wine for the wedding. All of the expenses were noted um, the mother-in-law probably did this every single day. And then right after the wedding, Amelie started shopping at the Bon Marche, all noted in the ledger. What did she buy? Everything, furniture, rugs, Japanese vases. She was entering society and she wanted to make a big splash. So she decided to capitalize on her major asset, which was her beauty. She became her own work of art and the effect was almost painterly. She put rouge on her ears 
and her lips, and she enhanced her white skin. There were rumors at the time that she ingested small amounts of arsenic. People did that to maintain a pallor. But her mother-in-law's ledger tells all. Her beauty secret was white rice face powder. Next slide, please. This is the only existing photograph of Amelie. And you can see she always went for the profile. She enjoyed a meteoric rise and became an instant celebrity. There were riots in the streets traffic jams with people trying to get a glimpse of her. And when she went to the beach to swim, there were crowds watching to see if her skin changed color when she came out of the water. She was even written about in the New York Herald. And remember, you know, this is way before the internet, but her fame crossed the globe. She was called a professional beauty. The art students loved her, and many artists were desperate to paint her, but Amelie refused all of them until she met John Singer Sargent. Could I have the next slide, please? This is probably the only attractive picture of John Singer Sargent because he looks relatively thin and even kind of come hither in it. Sargent was making a name for himself in art circles. He was born in Florence in 1856 the son of American expatriate parents, Fitzwilliam and Mary Sargent, who never stopped moving from one European capital to another. They moved to Paris in 1874, so Sargent could study with Carolus Duran, one of the leading portraitists of the time. Remember, Paris was a huge campus for art students from all over the world. Being an artist was a respectable profession then, like being a lawyer or a businessman. You could actually make money. Sargent was not embracing la vie de Bohème. He wanted to be successful and he distinguished himself immediately. Other students said of his work, he makes me want to shake myself. Within three years, he was on the radar. Now it was time for him to establish himself at the annual salon. We can't even imagine how big an event it was. Think Academy Awards, think Can, think red carpet. Sargent wanted to join the A-list of portrait painters and win lucrative commissions. But to do this, he needed a big idea. To be truly successful, an artist had to have a business plan. That's when he turned his eye on Amelie Gautreaux. She was at the height of her beauty and celebrity. So Sargent mounted a campaign to win her approval, enlisting the help of friends they had in common. One friend was Dr. Samuel Jean Pazzi, respected gynecologist, surgeon, and man of the arts, but best known for his breathtaking beauty and insatiable appetite for sex. Pazzi used his profession as entree to the best bedrooms in Paris. Husbands never suspected. Their wives would say, I feel sick, can you call the doctor? And they would call for Dr. Pazzi, who the wives called Dr. Love. Next slide, please. Sargent painted him in 1881 in a scarlet dressing gown, his long white fingers the tools of his profession over his heart. The other hand playing with his robe as if to take it off. This was really unconventional. Sergeant called Pazzi and the other people in his glittering decadent world, brilliant creatures. At the time, Pazzi was having an affair with Amelie, one of his many conquests. Did anyone see them, I wonder, hanging together at the Met? The two portraits were side by side. And all you could think of was, what happened in the museum when those lights went out? Pazzi put in a good word for Sargent and miraculously, Amelie said yes. Very optimistic about his future, Sargent moved to a larger studio on the Boulevard Berthier, a fashionable new neighborhood in Paris. 
Then Sargent learned firsthand the meaning of the adage, watch out what you wish for. Amelie turned out to be, in Sargent's words, an unpaintable beauty. He picked a dress, a black satin gown, but he couldn't settle on a pose. Young and spoiled, Amelie couldn't sit still. He tried one pose after another some 30 times into the summer. Next slide, please. Here you can see, she almost looks as if she's saying, are we there yet? <laughs> uh, she definitely is not into this portrait sitting thing. But was it that difficult to paint her? Or did Sargent have a crush on Amelie and wanted to extend his time with her? He got past that and just kept painting. Hard at work, Sargent finished Amelie's portrait, but first he completed a lovely little oil sketch of her, soft and romantic, very, very different from Madame X. Next slide, please. This is Madame Gautreaux drinking a toast. And I had a funny experience. I was at the Isabel Gardner Museum in Boston where this painting is hanging. And I was standing in front of the painting and the guard came over to me and said, she had a drinking problem. Well, she didn't, she was just enjoying a glass of champagne. Um, but it's, 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 if you think about this, when you look at the portrait Madame X, you can see it's showing a very different representation of this woman. Finally, he positioned her standing in her black gown, leaning on a table that was too short to really support her. And one day while they were working, the jeweled strap of her gown slipped down. She might've tried to shrug it back in place, but Sargent, a genius at finding the gesture that revealed his subject's essence, like Pazzi fingering his tassel, convinced her to leave it hanging. So what did Amelie think of her portrait? She loved it. Next slide, please. It's kind of hard to see, but this is actually a letter that both Sargent and Amelie wrote to a friend of theirs, a mutual friend, telling her that the portrait was a masterpiece. She and Sargent were certain the salon debut would confirm their celebrity. Next slide, please. So this was the original Madame X. One strap hanging, just like on my doll. Her white exposed shoulder. This is what they sent to the 1884 salon. Let's take a second to have a snapshot of Paris in 1884 as the salon was about to happen. What did the French enjoy at the time? Like us, they loved reality entertainment. They went to wax museums, they read tabloid newspapers, but the hottest ticket in town was the morgue. Now you may want to correct me, but it's my understanding that the word morgue comes from the old French word morguerre, which means to look at solemnly. They weren't so solemn. Whenever there was an interesting body at the morgue, people lined up for blocks and there were vendors selling fruit and food and the show changed every day. So that's what they enjoyed in entertainment. And now finally, it's varnishing day at the salon, April 30th, everyone was there. Many of the artists, Bouguereau, Henner, Puvi, Benjamin Constant, featured eye-catching nudes in their paintings. But in the academic tradition, there were rules that differentiated between nude and naked, and these artists obeyed them. Nudes were smooth and sexless, cosmeticized, Reality and art was apparently a horrifying concept to the same people who lined up to see the bodies at the morgue. Nudes were also supposed to be historical or mythological figures, nymphs, Arabian princesses, women removed from real life. However idealized, even the most classical nudes were erotic. Salon exhibitions provided easy access to sexual images that were not a part of daily life. So how did salon goers react to Madame X? They 
hated it. They said it was monstrous, detestable, horrible. Critics said Sargent had no talent and they ridiculed Amelie. Next slide, please. Here are a couple of the caricatures that were in the newspapers at the time, all making fun of that dropped strap. An eyewitness at the salon reported that Amelie wept real tears for her offended beauty. Sergeant and Amelie were devastated. Her family insisted that he withdraw the painting from the salon. Sergeant refused, although he did ask if he could take it down to make an adjustment. He wanted to repaint that fallen strap. And that's exactly what he did as soon as the painting was back in his studio where it remained for the next 30 years. Slide, please. Sargent left town. He went to England to work and to contemplate his uncertain future. In England, he spent time in Broadway, an idyllic community of artists and illustrators. And there he reclaimed his career by painting Carnation Lily, Lily Rose. Slide, please. A study in innocence, just as Madame X was a study in decadence. With this painting, Sargent was back on the map. He became the favorite portrait painter of the very rich. And one person said he was popular because his paintings made wealthy people realize just how rich they really were. Meanwhile, Amelie went to her country house to plot a course of action. She decided to fight art with art, hoping to reclaim her lost celebrity. She was painted over and over again, first in an unsuccessful attempt to obliterate Madame X, then in an even more futile attempt to equal it. The first painting was conventional, very Gainsborough, and she's so covered up that she might as well be wearing a turtleneck. But it was so modest that there was no reaction from the public. So she thought about her next move. And this is what she did. Next slide, please. She dropped her strap again. This is by Gustave Courtois. And notice that this time her dress is white, her ear is rouged, but that strap is still hanging. People didn't really respond to this painting either. Next slide. This was her favorite painting of herself by Gandhara. And she actually owned it and it hung in her house. And then later it went to her relatives in Louisiana um, where it hangs today at the museum. Um, actually now it's, it's in um, Charleston. Uh, her descendants donated it to the museum there. Next slide, please. And this was a woodcut that was done of her. She's still wearing the crescent in her hair. Her chin is a little less defined as often happens, um, but she's still very much Madame X. But years later, when Amelie was in her forties, the mother of a grown daughter and estranged from her husband, Amelie went to Cannes and overheard a conversation between two women. They were discussing her and they said, she just doesn't look very good anymore. At that, Amelie packed her bags, took a private train home to Brittany, covered all the mirrors in the house and became a recluse. She walked the beach alone at night, the very beach where she had drawn crowds to watch her swimming, her face covered with a veil. She died in 1915 at the age of 56, alone and anonymous. Amelie was condemned to live in the shadow of Madame X for her entire life. Like the legendary Dorian Gray, she was tyrannized by her own image, driven to new levels of vanity in her endless and ultimately foolish attempt to pursue fame and immortality. There's a sadistic genie who always grants a wish, but does so in a way that the result is a nightmare for the poor person who makes that wish and doesn't read the fine print. This was the case for both Sargent and Amelie. 
1884, all Sargent wanted was to be a successful portrait painter. Over 500 portraits later, he wanted to run away from these portrait commissions. No one would let him paint anything else. Amelie's fate was more ironic and far more tragic. In 1915, the year that she died, Sargent offered to sell Madame X to the Metropolitan Museum. He had been approached before, but always refused. When he wrote to the Met, he said, I suppose it is the best thing I have ever done. He also said that he would prefer it if the museum did not use the lady's name on the painting, alluding to the fight they had after the 1884 Salon. But this is really strange. Who would have made a fuss? Amelie was dead. Her husband had been estranged from her for at least 15 years. But whatever the motivation, Sargent denied Amelie all that she ever wanted. She would be famous, but nobody would ever know her name. They would only know her as Madame X. Both painting and woman were works of art, but Madame X, not Amelie, turned out to be the real and enduring masterpiece. Today, Madame X hangs at the Metropolitan Museum. The beauty who never worked a day in her life worked six days a week, wearing the same dress and showing a few lines and signs of age. Yet, she has been called the face that launched a thousand loan requests. You can find her in countless exhibitions. And most recently, her story was turned into a ballet by Christopher Wheeldon at the Royal Ballet of London. And she has her own book, Strapless. So that's her story. Thank you, that was terrific. Um, we had several questions uh, prior to this evening. Some of them you might have covered um, a little bit. One of them was, um, I think we know where you found the subject for this book. Uh, where do you find the subjects for some of the other books that uh, we spoke of? And uh, why are you attracted to scandals? Or are you attracted to scandals? Well, as I said, this, this um, book came from a black dress from borrowing a black gown. But I think that what all of, of my books have in common in terms of inspiration is that I find an idea and I can't let go of it. I mean, I probably have 10 ideas a day and I forget them by the time I have lunch. Mm -hmm. But when there's that idea that becomes an obsession and I want to know more about it, I trust that readers will want to know more about it as well. Um, so if I can't let go, then I go ahead and I start researching. And I do love scandals, Aileen, you're right. Uh, and the reason that I love them is that they tend to burn very bright at the time that they happen. And they're well-documented in headlines and in correspondence and, and there's lots of, of, of you know, chatter about them, but they tend to fade with time especially if you're talking about something that happened in a, a previous century, until they're forgotten. And that gives me the opportunity to bring them to life. So yes, I do love scandals. Right. So for, the, for example, the, um, the story you mentioned about Booker T. Washington, now you got that idea for that book. I mean, maybe you could tell people how you got the idea for that book. Yeah, so this is the <laughs> Guest of Honor is a book about um, the first time a black man had dinner at the White House. And it created the most enormous scandal and I had never heard of it until I listened to John McCain give his concession speech on the night of the election in um, 2008. And he said, you know, we've come a long way since there was this scandal when a black man was invited to just dine at the White House. And I thought, huh. And I started to look into it and I realized that it was the story the whole world was talking about in the year that it happened in 1901. And it had been completely forgotten since then. And it gave me material for an entire book. So, you know, that's what a good scandal can do. 
And your books are, 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 are incredibly historically detailed. Do you have a background, a formal background as a historian or, or, or anything in art history, for example? My background was, um, you know, I was an English major and, and, and I've always been a writer and I've always been a really good researcher. I'm like, you know, the dog with the bone, I won't let go. Um, but in the case of Strapless, I did not have a background in art history and that really served me well because again, I was looking for the story behind the canvas and I didn't know what the rules were. So I broke them all. You know, I, I, I just went out and worked like a detective and went to places where people hadn't gone before. I actually found Madame X's grave. Oh. And it was, um, I was in Brittany and I was working with somebody there who worked for the Chamber of Commerce. And she said, I know where the Gautreau Mausoleum is. Maybe we should go there. So we went there and literally no one had been there in probably a hundred years. We had to pick aside debris and brush aside dirt. And there it was, she was buried there. And that's not typically what an art historian would do. You know, they wouldn't go that far. Wow. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Sargent's, uh, Sargent's real emotional involvement with Emily. Was he infatuated with her or was he only inspired by her physique and hoping to create this masterpiece? You mentioned it a little bit um, and just going for the success. Um, and maybe uh, did he have any, any kind of an emotional involvement with either of his models? You know, it, that's a really interesting question because um, Sargent, while the most accomplished and skilled painter, always did his best paintings, portraits of sitters with whom he had an emotional relationship. You can see it, it's different. You know, whether you're looking at Madame X or you're looking at Dr. Pazzi or you're looking at um, portrait of, of Lily Millet, of a dear friend of his, there's, there's almost an exchange going on. And it was so apparent to those of us who were studying Sargent that we actually mounted an exhibition called Sargent's Women and put all of those paintings in one room so that you could actually see that there was a different kind of warmth in the painting when Sargent felt strongly about the woman. Did he have a crush on Amelie? I believe he did. Sargent, you know, many people assume that, that he was gay and, and he may have been in his later years, but in this year, he was like a kid who goes to college for the first time and has absolute freedom to do whatever they want. Mommy's not watching uh, sexually. And that's what he did. It was his first year of freedom from his parents. And he experimented. He, people believe that he had an affair with Judith Gautier, the writer, that summer, who lived not far from Madame X. Um, if he didn't get to do anything with Dr. Pazzi, he was certainly infatuated by him. And I think that he was just sowing his wild oats and his attraction to Amelie was real. Okay, um, what, this is a question that's been working in my brain. I was wondering if the scandal surrounding the painting was fueled by jealousy. Were other artists jealous of his success? Were women jealous of Amelie's standing in Parisian society? Was there an, a political animus? Do you think it's a story of two foreigners who were trying to get ahead in a society that wasn't really ever open to them and that maybe people are very happy for their downfall at the end? Well, let's not forget that Sargent and Amelie were Americans in Paris. And so they were outsiders. And there was a fear that Sargent was becoming Paris's most popular artist, just as Amelie was becoming the most popular beauty. Um, and the writing was on the wall. Uh, to further inflame the situation, there was a tricky tariff situation with, with um, between France and, and the United States at the time. Um, the US put a very high tariff on French paintings 
that were brought into the country. Yet American artists were able to study in Paris for free. And the French rightfully thought that this was unfair. So, you know, there was a political thing going on. And then there's human nature. We place people on pedestals for one reason, so that we can push them off. And I think that the painting was the catalyst for that moment. You know, these people have gotten too famous, too popular. Boom, your moment is over. And the tariff situation still exists, but that's something else. <laughs> anyway, um, Emily is described, you mentioned before that she's described as someone who would not sit still. And at the time of her portrait, you mentioned she was only 23 years old. Do you think that her ambition outweighed her young age and she just wasn't able to predict the consequences of her actions? <laughs> what 23 year old can predict the consequences of their actions? Um, I think that we have to look at portraiture as the Instagram of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, she was, she imagined that she would use this image of herself to, um, to get lots of likes. And um, how many young people today pursue fame on social media without considering the consequences that it can turn on you so quickly? Mm -hmm. um, she thought that putting this image out there would just validate her popularity and her beauty when it's inevitable that at some point that will fade. But that I think is just, you know, yeah, that's what happens with young people. They don't think. Well, they have to go to the museum and take a look at her portrait. Um, Emily was called a professional beauty by some uh, by people at the time. Could it be considered a valid profession considering the lack of career opportunities for women at the time? Absolutely, there were no career opportunities. You could write, I mean, Judith Gautier was a writer but if you if you didn't do that and you were in the upper class you know where it would have been unheard of to have a profession being a professional beauty was the only avenue open to you but let's not forget being a professional beauty was hard work you know you had to change your clothes seven or eight times a day you had to you know your hair had to be perfect your makeup had to be perfect this was a full-time job. And this was at a time when many people, you know, I'm sure that Amelie wasn't one of them. Many people didn't have hot water. You know, I mean, just keeping clean was a full-time job. Yet she, um, and with her increasing fame, had to maintain a standard that was probably exhausting. And then not only did you have to, you know, dress and quaff yourself, you had to make appearances. So it was the opera every night. It was, you know, parties every night. You had to look your best. Um, she probably, you know, exerted more calories than a day laborer at the end of the day. Um, Did you have any other interests at all besides beside her social calendar and her makeup and, um, and uh, her clothing? Did she she did actually. Um, and this, this will surprise you. She was very interested in politics. And she kept trying to get Pedro um, into politics. He tried a few times. He was never successful because he apparently had zero personality. And, um, you know, he certainly wasn't good looking. But she consorted with some of the, you know, greatest politicians of, of, of the time and um, invited them to her salon. And, and, and this was something that, that genuinely interested her. Um, it wasn't something that she obviously could pursue herself, but she was totally interested in politics. And I have two final questions uh, and then we'll open it up to the chat there. Um, you describe in detail how uh, Sergeant selected her black dress and he took it out of her closet. So presumably she had worn this dress at some time in her life. And I, my understanding is that her husband even bought the dress for her. So if black was considered erotic and the dress was particularly revealing, why didn't anybody anticipate the potential of danger or it didn't, didn't have to do with the dress at all, but just trying to, as you say, perhaps to just tear down her reputation? 
Well, it was the dress, but it was also the pose. And, you know, let's not forget, I mean, Sargent was pushing the envelope here. Um, think about Andy Warhol. You know, Andy Warhol took pictures and did portraits of people. Some of them are nude and they're really nude. You know, they're, they're in the photographs. The best way to get attention is to be modern, to push things. Sargent knew what he was doing. He just went too far and didn't factor in the notion that people might be gunning for him to begin with, you know, that they were looking for any excuse to push him off that pedestal. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to be modern, then you wouldn't put somebody in, you know, a frilly dress with lots of underwear. Um, you would do something that was more distinctive and something that was more eye catching. And he did all of that. He just wasn't prepared for the, uh, the hostile reaction that was already building before anybody even saw the painting. Well, it looked like it even looked to a certain extent like his mentor encouraged him. And he probably knew what was going to happen. Well, we know that story, don't we? Um, Carolus Duran was the most popular portrait painter. And here his student was poised to take his place. Mm -hmm. Is it too much to think that maybe Carolus Duran said, oh no, it's great. Show that painting, <laughs> you know, knowing full well that he might be setting his student up for a fall. I mean, that's, you know, it all comes back to the fact that human nature never changes. Mm -hmm. And the last question just is, the ending of the book reads like the ending of a movie. I sort of visualize the credits rolling down in the front of the screen. The observer then learns what happened to everybody in the movie, the fate of each one of the characters in the movie. And I was wondering when you wrote the ending, if you thought about the possibility of making this book into, uh, into a movie at some point in time. Well, that's so funny because, you know, when I was, when I was writing, when I was researching and I came across all of this eyewitness material about um, Amelie's, um, you know, covering her mirrors and, and becoming a recluse and walking the beach in a veil. I mean, this is all an eyewitness account. Mm -hmm. So it's true. And I thought, you know what, if I made that up, nobody would believe it. Mm -hmm. But it's true. And it is an incredibly um, cinematic ending to the story. I wasn't thinking, you know, gee, this would make a great movie, but Hollywood was. And Strapless was optioned from the day it was published. It, it has been optioned so many times. <laughs> um, it's very hard to get a period piece, you know, that largely takes place in France off the ground. That's an expensive production. But um, interestingly, the book is now being done by a French writer, director. Uh, her name is uh, Marine Franzen. And she did a remarkable movie. I don't remember what the French title is, but the English title is The, the Sower, S-O-W-E-R. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's really an incredible film about a, um, a society, a, a village of women whose husbands disappear during one of the wars and, and they have to maintain the village themselves. And she's just a very you know, evocative writer who really knows how to tell. This was what was important to me. I wanted somebody who could make the story young. I didn't want it to be an old story. I wanted it to be about young people. So she's working on the script and hopefully you know, she will be directing it and the production will be done in France. Um, is it Rachel or Christine? Um, I think Christine, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so during the uh, Deborah's presentation, I mean, or discussion about her book, Sandy Goodman wrote, Sargent was a known homosexual. I doubt he seriously considered Amelie romantically. Well, Deborah, you addressed that. There were that the, but he was, a, it doesn't mean she, he was, he considered her romantically, but it was, he was attached to his oh, subject, I, I, as I you said. To, I'm sorry, I have to correct um, the person who, wrote the question. Sargent later in life was a, as she says here, she says, known homosexual. Closet. During this summer, Sargent had an affair with Judith Gautier. 
And the affair was so passionate that he actually ripped a tabletop from the table and threw, threw it onto the floor and threw her on top of it. Re sexuality is a very fluid thing. And again, I, I invite everybody to think of Sargent as a young man mm. who was experimenting. And he wasn't sure at this moment in his life who he wanted to be. And he tried, he had an affair with Judith Gautier who had affairs with everybody. Um, he had a crush on Posse. He, he definitely had a crush on Amelie, even if it didn't come to fruition. Um, and he was also involved with another male art student at the time. Uh, he was pansexual at that moment. Who he chose to be moving forward is another story. Um, so the second question was from Robbie Weinman. Appreciate your telling us the story of the famous dinner at the White House. So you, you talked about that. And then Christy Moraga wrote, you said her mother was a belle of a plantation. Does that mean that her grandfather was a slave owner? Yes, I guess. I'm yes. sure it does. Yeah. Yes. You know, Parlage Plantation um, still exists today. Um, you can see it in Louisiana. It's quite beautiful. And what's really interesting about it is that the family has maintained the living room exactly the way it was um, when Amelie uh, in her youth lived there and paintings of her mother are still on the wall and the toys, are, everything is still there. Um, it's, it's a remarkable place, but this was the, you know, it's a different moment in history. And there was another question from Kathleen Gilgi. I'm sorry if I pronounced the, the, her name wrong. Uh, no, it's not, it's, no, it's Bethan who wrote, do you know about Kathleen Gilgi's series of Sergeant's Women? Women, they're all nudes. I don't know it, but I, I will look it up. It's, um, and then, and the last one is, uh, someone says, let me find it now in the, yes. Why did you call it strapless and not off the shoulder <laughs> or something else? Because strapless is a great word. Um, and you know, it's, 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 it's a funny thing with book titles. Um, they come to you and sometimes they're not good, but when, when it resonates, you know, and you live with it for a while, you, you know, you know, it's the right title. And, and for me, it had many meanings because not only was it that it was the story of a painting with a fallen strap, but it was also the idea that Amelie was sent into a, a kind of fall, you know, that she was strapless, that someone who rose so high suddenly found herself free falling. Oh. And it, it just seemed to, it resonated with me. It seemed to have many meanings. Okay, so uh, Rachel, do you know if someone else wants to ask something? Oh, Joan asks, you mentioned she had a daughter. Was she equally a beauty? And were they as estranged as she died alone, a recluse? Her daughter was a beauty, Louisa. Um, she married and she died very young. So she predeceased Madame X, um, which was very sad. Um, that's why she was alone, uh, because her daughter was dead. Okay, I don't see any more questions. I don't know if anyone on the screen now wants to ask something. No more? I have, I have a question. Uh, Deborah, you mentioned that um, she, one of her, her interests was politics and she attempted to get her husband into uh, the political arena. Did she uh, do anything else? Did she have any salons? Did she, in the background, try to influence any politicians or any particular policies if she did have, in fact, this, <clears throat> this interest in politics? Uh, the most I know is that um, she's depicted in at many political salons. And, and if I, I wish I could remember who was involved, um, I can't at the moment. But I, I think that her, her most forceful effort in politics was with 
her husband, um, mm -hmm. where there are records of, you know, her kind of pushing him into local elections in Brittany, you know, year after year, and he would lose to the, you know, the, the most inconsequential people because nobody wanted to vote for him. Um, but that, that was, uh, it, in some of her letters, she talked about um, various politicians, but nothing, you know, no names that I recall and, and certainly not policies, but it was something that she, she, throughout her later life, she kept dabbling in either, you know, showing up at these places, at these salons or having salons for these politicians and, and mm -hmm. repeatedly inserting Pedro into the political discourse. I, I've read also that she was a very accomplished uh, pianist. Is that, is that true? She played the piano pretty well or you're not sure? I played the piano really yeah. well. <laughs> no, no, not really. Uh, she could have, I don't, I don't recall. Oh, no. Okay. I have a question about your research, though. Um, we we touched it on the beginning. You you don't speak French. You did speak French when you were, were and how much? Oh, did you oh, Aileen, this is this is my I mean, humiliation. This is the audience française. I mean, how much did you? How much time did you spend in France on your research? Uh, I, and how long did it take you to write the book? And and how did you make out? So you know, happy day. I I write my proposal, the book sold overnight. I have this contract to write a book. Um, remember I told you about the genie that you're supposed to read the fine print? Okay, well, they want the book in a year, which is kind of unheard of, but they're very, ex the publisher was very excited about the subject. And I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me before that all of this research would have to be done or most of it in France and I don't speak French. Now, Fortunately, my husband uh, was fluent. So, you know, he accompanied me and we would go off on these research expeditions. I, you know, went back and forth, I don't know, six or seven times, focusing some of my time in Paris, some of my time in Brittany, and he was able to translate for me. And when it came to some of the more um, arcane documents, you know, Pedro was a member of the Legion of Honor, so there was actually quite a nice file about him, but you know, that was real French. Um, my husband was in the movie business and one of his, um, one of the stars of his films was a French actor who was married to an American and they lived in Paris. So Alexandra became my companion and would come to me to, you know, to libraries and, and would sit by my side and say, this is what this says, you know, and this is what that says. And so I, I muddled my way through it. Still wish that I could speak French, but, you know, I had enough help, especially from my husband um, when we were on location that we managed to get by. Never too late, Alliance Francaise. <laughs> it is too late, you know, I, I, I actually, took a class at the Alliance Francaise and I think I got the award of for, for worst student, most enthusiastic, but zero pronunciation. I, I couldn't speak my way out of a paper bag. I just, I have a tin ear, but I tried. Yeah, that's well. Lorella, did you want to ask a question before we wrap up? Thank you so much. I was just wondering whether uh, she was interested in the Impressionists. I mean, you were talking about the political salon, but did she go to any of the important impressionist exhibitions? Was she interested in art? I, I have not seen a reference to that. Um, she's certain, you know, what her interest in terms of art was. She certainly would have gone to the opening, to the vernissage of every salon because, you know, it was the place to be seen. Um, but there's no record of her having any particular interest in paintings that weren't of her. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christine asked, how forthcoming were her descendants with showing you her private papers for your research? Well, her descendants were very forthcoming, but they didn't have any private papers. One of the um, relatives uh, in South Carolina who had inherited this painting had written a little booklet that included some anecdotes um, that went way back, but they weren't 
from Amelie. They were about Amelie and, and they were very generous with that. I really had to go to um, other kinds of files. And, and it was interesting in Paris, um, the name Gautreau is pretty common. And uh, I was at one of the libraries and I had asked for all of the files relating to the name Gautreau. And, you know, I was sitting there with Alexandra, my research assistant, and they brought out a pile that was like this, Gautreau, Gautreau, Gautreau. And, you know, I was looking through them and I was getting museum head, you know, which is what happens when you spend a lot of time going through these papers. And it was literally the last file that said Gautreau. And I opened it and instantly I recognized a drawing of the Chateau de Chêne, which was her house in Brittany. It was her stationery. And it was a letter written by her. And it, it didn't really say anything important except for one thing. She signed it Amelie. At this point in time, scholars, if they were looking at Madame X at all, knew that her name was Virginie, so they called her by her first name. It turns out she never used that. She always called herself Amelie. So my finding that letter led to the discovery or the identification of another letter that was signed by Amelie Gautreau. So one thing leads to another. And, um, and it was just a, a, a fascinating kind of string of pearls process. And now there is maybe that would be the that could be the last question. Bethan is asking, how did you feel about Amelie at the end of your research? You know, I can't write about people who I don't love, because when you write a book, you have to spend an incredible amount of time with these people. And if you don't like them, you know, then, then how can you spend time with them? It's just like choosing friends. Um, I knew that she had flaws, but I felt very sorry for her. I thought that she was somebody who, you know, was probably full of passion and ambition and, and was so young when she made the wrong decisions. Um, so I had nothing but affection for her. And I often wondered, if she had been a 23 year old today, you know, what would her fate have been? Maybe the same, but I, I was very fond of her. I think we, Rachel, if I'm not mistaken, we sort of have to wrap it up here. Um, yes, it, so I think I it's want time. To, mm -hmm. I want you to thank uh, Deborah for sharing the story of Madame X with us this evening. Um, I think many of us look forward to reading your other books. And I wanted to thank uh, the members of the committee, the um, event committee, including uh, Christine who, uh, Chevelle, who brought this idea to us and um, in our cultural committee. And to, we're going to have a lot of other programs that maybe Rachel can tell you about in the months to come. Um, this is a, certainly a terrific, a terrific evening. And uh, I thank you very much, Deborah, for uh, sharing it with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leileen, and, and thank you, Christine, who, who I've enjoyed talking to. Um, we share many interests. Uh, and thank you all for listening, and, and I hope you enjoyed the story. And, and if we, just uh, to say, if we can one day go back to the Met and have a private tour, we would love to organize that, and with uh, someone who could show us Amelie and explain in front, in front of the, I mean, now you know more than you did before an hour ago, but still uh, meet in front of the, the painting. And of course, Deborah, we will let you know if that happens. There are in the midst of people who are there tonight, there are people who work at the Met and could certainly uh, organize that for us when private tours are reopened at the Met. So we would love to have you there and we'll let you know if it happens. Yes, we can all raise a glass to Madame X. Mm -hmm. Rosé. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a fascinating presentation yeah. and uh, we're, we're very lucky to have you with us tonight. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Aileen, for organizing this. Thank you, Christine. And thanks to the Cultural Committee.